You see who your friends are pretty quickly. Uh, you, you would know. I, I very much the, know. The first yeah. trial, we had to walk into the bank and ask for 200k. Yeah. And that was an unbelievable conversation to have. I was leaning quietly to him and I said, oh, I, I need to know how, how long do you think that I was going to be inside for if yeah. this went the wrong way? And he goes, mate, he said 14 on the bottom. Okay, Ben and Amy Smith, welcome back to uh, part two of I Catch uh, Killers. Ben, we uh, we finished off part one uh, where you had uh, just been granted uh, granted bail. Yep. Um, pretty heavy charges, or well, not pretty heavy. It was well, it's not muck around. There it was about as horrendous allegations as you could uh, have a, have against you. You guys have met up. What was the fallout from this? Like this, we've talked the twenty four hours where. Yeah. Ben's gone to work and the next thing you hear, Amy's in custody and he's been arrested. Ben, you've been in the dock, bail refused. You never thought you'd find yourself in this this position. You've got bail. Okay, so I would imagine that was your focus for that 24, 27 hours or whatever you were in custody for. What happened then? What where did what did you do and where did you go? Home. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we it, it was just you start, we started, it felt like we started to just live life every minute by minute, really. How do you, you, you can't really explain it. We had no Christmas presents. We had no, you know, we'd, we'd spoken to plenty of close and immediate people to Obviously, people who were we'd already made aware of things, family, and reassured people were okay. And oh, it's a bit of a blur. Yeah, I, we can. Can I just ask, just on that, before we get to you, Ben? How do you tell people that? Like, I, I'm just picturing you. You phone up your sister, you phone up your brother, and go, "Oh, guess what? Oh, how are you going? I'm not real good. Guess what? Oh, Ben's been arrested. And oh, what for? Oh, he's been charged with 12 counts of sexual assault. Like, how do you have that conversation? We, <laughs> that was pretty much posted on Facebook on a week later. Not the sexual assault part, but we certainly put on there, you know, that our Christmas had not started the way we thought it would and some extremely serious allegations had been made against Ben of a historical nature and... If anybody knew Ben at a certain, we put a certain time window, could they please reach out and contact us? And we were aware that people were obviously starting to become aware of it because it just it's information that kind of gets out, I suppose. And it, yeah, it, we, we, we started to just invite people over in groups of four and five, did we? When, once we start to get to friends and telling friends and, and we had, you know, four and, and it's interesting when we would go back and say to them, we can talk to them now and go, what did you think we were going to tell you? And they, they would go, we didn't think you were going to say that. They thought we were going to tell them that one of us was really ill or t like had a really serious illness. Oh, right, illness. so it was an invite over, I've got something to tell you, come over. And we yep. did it in groups because, God, it was just exhausting to keep telling the same information over and over. But we, I mean, I guess the point is we never hid away from it. We t and, and, you know, we have very close friends in our neighbours. Um, in fact, both of our immediate neighbours were witnesses in court for Ben. But um, we sat them down because their kids would come to our house. So that's that's another level, isn't it? I hadn't even thought about that. But it, it's people around you. Well, are you this heinous offender that these allegations have been made against you? I just take you back to um, posting on social media, and you were actively at that point in time, or proactively trying to get people that could uh, give evidence on the matter. That's how. So, sort of, I think for for us, and it actually ended up being very good evidence in court that we were never afraid of these allegations because we knew that they were obviously false. And not only did we we obviously knew that, but it was able to be proven. You know, you talk about having to prove a case. You know, a prosecution has to prove a case 
essentially we can just turn up and go, did you prove it? No, all right, no worries, see you later. But we could turn up with all the evidence. You mentioned earlier about uh, you could highlight through the fact sheet with a highlighting pen all, all the inconsistencies and things that just don't don't add up. Before we get into breaking down the, the nature of the charges, Ben, your life, you did you turn up to work the next day? Like what the, just explain what happens. Um, you very quickly in a in a agency where you're just a you know you're just one person. You turn up to work, you do your job, you go home. Yep. Um, I became the number one person I think that every boss in Canberra wanted to speak to and wanted to have meetings with and um yeah and it was it was really confronting because um you know they thought like they wanted to sit down and know every detail well it stood you down as well you were stood down ben hasn't yeah. worked since then so we had well initially where new south wales police is very equipped they've got a massive organisation yeah. um they've got specific areas that deal with these types of things. So there's, you know, Get referred there's pre to the welfare yeah, branch or yeah, there's the precedent set yeah. in relation to it. There there wasn't anything when I was there. So it was initially they um, you know, I got issued with a letter not to turn up I couldn't turn up to work. Yep. Couldn't enter the building. Um, and uh, they put me off on miscellaneous leave on full pay. And during that time, as I said, it was like I'd be getting emails and, you know, such and such from here wants to see you, such and such. And then it was, I was getting phone calls. Oh, Rodio, well, we've organized to, uh, this location. Can you come and see us? And this is where we start talking about the mental health issues and emotional torture. Yeah. You know, you think about the last time I got a phone call from a boss from the agency. Yeah, where do I end up? <laughs> yeah, I can see why you. And I've got. Bit. I've now got. A, I've now got multiple that I've never met before asking Ask me to him, come yeah. to locations that I have no control over. She can't get in contact with me. That was just uncope. I could not physically cope with that. If I, even if I would. For, for a very long period of time, and this will make me sound so needy and high maintenance. Okay. That's what Ben was saying before we started. <laughs> As if, Gary, come on now. No, but um, if I call him and can't get him, it is a pit of anxiety, not now, not now so much at all, but, but at that particular point, if I would call and couldn't get him, the pit of anxiety was un un it's unexplainable what that would feel like like to a point where I'd almost be physically sick. Go into a panic. And and they did get him, like they did call him into a meeting once and the meeting was supposed to be for a certain period of time. I knew the location and it went over. And uh, how many missed calls did you have? Yeah, I, uh, I just, I told them that I needed to check in yeah. with her as regularly as I could. So I was trying to stay stay on top of that. And after that, I just got invited to yeah, the meetings. I, I, yeah, we yeah. just turned around and said there's no way that this is going to happen without Okay, presence. well, that's a sensible call. Yeah. Did you feel like you had uh, support from uh, people that you worked with? Um, there, were, there were there, there were, like in the agency that I was working with. Yeah, and, uh, and even even with uh, the, the New South Wales cops because so, you spent a decade there. Yeah, well, I, I, I think – We've said it previously. My t team leader was a very good mate of mine. Yep, um, still is. He's still to this day, and um, and there was a network of people, um, not many. Yeah, that um, have stayed in or stayed in contact with me. You see who your friends are pretty quickly. Uh, you you would know. I, I very much the, know. Yeah, it, that you you you're with um, the best way to sleep. You come out of the academy. Join the cops. The brotherhood. You've instantly got this, you know, it's like an unlimited pool of people that you mm. go and see, different jobs, right squad, you go and do this, you meet people from different areas and, you know, you all come together, could be police footy, you know, and then you get, you know, that happens and 
Silent. It's like crickets. And a good mate of mine said to me once, he said, mate, this would be the best way to clean your, clean your phone out, phone list out. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Well, we talk about this presumption of innocence, but its uh, I know what you're saying about the phone. I, I reckon I could delete 90% of the numbers I had in on my phone when I got into trouble and it wasn't the uh, nature of the allegations that uh, you had, so I can only imagine. But the, I think the police family that we had, and, and that's what I would call them, a yeah. police family, because we, weddings, event, you know, you kind of, you always got all this stuff on. Yep. But that- pool went down to a very small amount of people and those small amount of people are still extremely good friends of ours and nothing changed in the way they dealt with us or the way they treated us as friends or the way they supported us but then a whole lot of other people it was it was little stuff like uh putting you on restricted friends as on Facebook, and then they would act like, oh, I didn't do that. And you can just see through it all. Yeah. It's, yeah. Quality quality over quantity is the best way to look at it. That is a good way of, uh, yeah, decluttering. Okay, so you, were, you never got to work another day. Uh, you were still being paid. At that point. Um, and what happened then? Because that uh, that finished too. Yeah, there was, there was a few meetings that went through when <sighs> – they, yeah, without going into the intricate details yeah. of it, because it was some time ago. Um, it wasn't long after that that um, I was then suspended without pay. Um, yeah, and then it was just a case of, right, we need to do everything we humanly possibly can to get to the troll. Yeah. Get to the troll date. So it was things like um, taking my long service leave, um, whether it be at half pay or whatever it is, just so we trying had, to string out just the- trying to string it as long as we could and then it was uh and then it was I think I may have taken my sick leave. You took sick leave, took you took some long service leave. and then you took annual leave at half pay. And that took us through till they they stood you down in September of twenty seventeen. And then all of that sort of leave and stuff took took us through till March before the trial in June. So, so there was- So that was, it's to March for June 2018, the yes, first trial? Yes, first trial, yeah. yeah. Okay. Legal expenses? Oh. It was- it, we, we went through two trials for this one. Yep. Um, and- the first yeah. trial, we had to walk into the bank and ask for two hundred k, yeah, and that was an unbelievable conversation to have because you're not borrowing it to. You, well, no, you're buy not borrowing it to put a second story on or do anything amazing. And and look, we 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 were pretty blessed at the time to have been in a, a, a okay financial position to be able to do that. But you know, how do you sit across the bank manager and go, "Oh, look, we've got some really serious." court matters that we need to resolve and we need to put 200k on a house where you lend it and I've, I, had, I had so much anxiety walking in for that but they just said yeah no worries <laughs> which was nice <laughs> but every, got- it confronts you you know how you said at the start that there's not a day since this happened that you haven't talked about thought about or whatever everywhere you turn it's you've been slapped in the face mm. um, and will continue for a long long time Okay, so the trial. Let's. I, I want to wind back and uh, Ben, you're a. Uh, before the trial, there's an investigation, obviously. Yep. And the, the briefs presented. So people that haven't been involved in the trial, the prosecution, the the police in this matter, would have to present a brief of evidence, and that served on the defence. And uh, then we go to trial. You're a police officer, Ben. Law enforcement. After after the police, you have a sense of what goes into uh, briefs of evidence and investigations. How would you describe the investigation that was done in regards to the allegations that were made against you? For me, I don't understand how difficult it was to see through what was put on that paper. It was. Appalling. I is just, a word. Yeah, I just, I just don't, I don't, I don't under, understand how they couldn't see through some of the initial statements that they got that there was some serious, serious issues just around timeline in its in its own. Yeah, that like that in itself should have should have put a big light 
light bulb moment and they should have went, there's something not right here. There's something not right. Well, I, I want you to continue on, but let's break it down for, for an investigation that allegations are made. Now, allegations are one thing, but then you look from an investigative point of view, have you got evidence that supports that or discredits that information? But one of the crucial things I would imagine, would well, not imagine, I know, is time, the timeline. Like, were you in the vicinity? Was it possible that you could have committed those offences? That's the first thing you look at when an allegation is made, if you thoroughly investigate it. Getting back to what you're saying when you said the timings of things, what are you talking about there? Um, in terms of where I was at particular point in, points in my life yep. are very easy to document. Why is that? Uh, it was where I was playing football. Okay. Um, I was injured at a particular point in time, meaning that I wasn't even in Sydney. Okay. I was lame at one point with a cast nearly up to my groin on the mid-north coast. And all these allegations, the 12 allegations, all related to one particular premises? Yes. 100%. So it was at one particular address, one location, and what you're saying here is that, uh, well, you weren't even there, um, and you can prove that because of injury through football or where you were playing certain, football. Certain, certain times of my life, I can document quite easily. The I noticed on the charge sheets that the uh, the dates are, are varied in, uh, in some regards, and uh, just referring to notes here. They're very broad. Yeah. But even with the broad uh, details of the uh, the accounts, you can uh, you're saying you weren't there. Correct. When did you become aware of this? When when did you become aware that uh, hold it? So, <laughs> apart from the fact when they handed me the fact sheet and there was all these unbelievable offences on it, yeah, <laughs> you sort of go, look, that was a incredibly difficult. However, um, Amy. Wanted us to get through Christmas. Uh, this happened five days before Christmas. It wasn't the best Christmas we've had, Gary. <laughs> um, Why? <laughs> so It's a little flat. Yeah. <laughs> just after Christmas, um, we were, I was taken to a um, solicitor or barrister. We, yeah, but but I think the key I think the key thing there was when did we discover this is one of our yeah. very close friends came over and he was actually with us the day the verdict came in and he's a very he's a very good friend of ours he just turned up on the day and he goes it just felt like something big was going to happen and i shit you not 15 minutes later they went we've got a verdict yeah. and i just turned and i looked at him and i went that is so weird. But anyway, he he'd come over to see us. He was one of the people that had come over to see us. He read the fact sheet. And the penny hadn't dropped for us at this point because I just don't think you can think very clearly. Like, you know, your cup is so full and overflowing with information yeah. that it is impossible to sit there and logically look at this thing. And he went, Ben, hang on a minute. Didn't you go and play at the Tigers? And I just remember it's like... I don't know, I feel like a switch was flicked and you just grabbed this fact sheet and you just started looking at dates and we got a pen and we just went, oh, Jesus. And we were just like ruling just pages pages of this stuff out. And it was that next day or it could have even been that, that, that day, I don't even remember, but I got up and I sat down and I retyped it because I only had it in mm. a stupid scanned format as you do there. And I just sat down and I put all the information about exactly where he was. And it, it, it was very early. It was within the first two weeks, but not immediately for us, but within the first two weeks where we kind of went, hang on a minute, and then these little parts of the brief would come in. So, so you might think, oh, well, how would the police necessarily know that? But senior members of the same family, parents, timelined him beautifully. In fact, his timeline was never once challenged ever through the trial. It wasn't- The timeline that you guys presented? Yeah. Well, the police presented it. Don't The police right. presented the timeline as well. Yeah. I don't know if they were just really unsure as to how 
a person could be in two places at once? Because uh, I'm looking at the, some of the dates on the day between the 1st of July 1999 and the 1st of July 2000. So that's over a 12-month period. Yes, and Ben was in Leichhardt. So all, all, these, <laughs> all these things that you could disprove. Correct. And let's wind it back to when we started this uh, talk where the accuser had told your friend, her relative, that you'd slept with uh, 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 had slept with her, mm -hmm. which you, you deny. Correct. There wasn't a lot of communication after that or with with this with the accuser? None. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm thinking what's going through your mind here. So you're looking at the charge sheets, you're saying, Oh, I wasn't even in town or I had my leg in plaster during during that period. You would have briefed your barrister and solicitor about that. So the interesting thing, you know, I met Danny for the first time. Danny being your Danny Ede, the yep. solicitor. Yep. And um he's a uh, he's a he's a very large human <laughs> and when you're meeting under that those circumstances and I'm obviously you know traumatized with what's what's occurred uh, when you walk in they always give you the worst news pos humanly possible yeah <laughs> you know it's like these are serious offenses you know if, convic indictable. if convicted you're going to jail blah 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 and we're just going mate just we've and he goes I don't I don't want to hear anything. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what that was all about at the start. And, you know, and I understand all that now because if, you know, someone had done something wrong yep. and they disclosed that, he can't, he's, got, yeah. he's got a legal obligation. He can, and, you know, and- not defend you. Yeah. And I'm, you know, you know, and as, as daunting as it was and as difficult it was, I, there is not a- person in the world that I wished to have had that uncomfortable moment with and walk into their office than Danny E. Yeah. He was unbelievable. I disliked him the moment I met him. He knows that. It's okay. He'll listen to this. You disliked him. He knows that. Yep. And I cried in his office on the first day. What? What? The, it just, just because it just, we just wanted to say, mate, this is just let's get this thrown out. And and I think that that is an important factor and I think we went through that for such a long time. We could look at this on paper and go, this is just abhorrent that we can yep. be, he can be facing charges for something that he wasn't physically there for, you know. And um, anyway, but then when we, when we met with him the second time, I, I felt a lot more prepared and I was able to – provide some timeline stuff and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, from then on, it's I, been I, a nice, it's been a wonderful relationship. I'm glad you two are getting on. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, when you're confronted with a situation like this, a lot there's a lot of emotion that comes in. So yeah. you want to defend it emotionally. How dare they make this all this allegation against me? I didn't do that. And what Danny probably did on that first occasion where you don't feel comfortable with it, they take the emotion out and just go, okay, what have we got here and look at it in a very clinical, but it almost feels like a sterile side of it when you're defending your you know, allegations against you and you've got someone saying, yes, but can we show this or can show that? And it just doesn't feel right, does it, with the emotion that comes. And if you, I mean, if you speak to him, like he had... Ben's life in his hands, essentially. He was responsible for making sure that everything happened legally and properly and I can't, I mean, I can talk about the pressure we felt. I can't imagine the pressure someone like him would feel in situations like that when you are defending somebody that you know is 150% innocent and... Well, Ben, if you went down for this, you'd probably be in the third year of a ten-year stint or something like that. Well, it was a it was an answer that I, a question that I asked him. Yeah. After. Yeah. We'd all went down just the road from the Downing Centre and had something to eat and a drink, and um, I just leaned quietly to him and I said, oh, I, "I need to know how how long do you think that I was going to be inside for if." Yeah. This went the wrong way. 
and he has made, he said, 14 on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, he's probably right if uh, if you're convicted of all these, uh, all these offences. You know, it was probably, there was, you know, throughout that process, there was probably two times that I asked those sorts of questions. One yeah. was to him, and that was the question that I just said, and the other one was to our, um, our barrister, right, Brett Longville. And um, it was when the jury went out, and I pulled him aside and I said, mate, I just need to be, you know, you just need to prepare me for both sides. Yeah. I said, obviously, I know what happens if, we, if, if what we know is going to happen happens. I said, but what if... I said, just tell me what you happens. Get convicted of it. Yeah, and he goes, mate, this is where you go. This is what will happen. This is what we'll do. And um, yeah. Okay. Were you looking at the brief from a police officer's point of view? No, but- I mate. I, I honestly, it was the most. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like I had my knees, my, my legs chopped from the knees down. I couldn't mentally do anything around the brief. So, when you're talking about you know having the perfect couple, yeah. um, you know if I didn't have Amy, oh, I'd, I'd like there was times that I'd sit at the computer screen for three hours and I couldn't get open the email. Yeah, and she'd come in and she'd go, "What are you doing?" I, was, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I just don't know. That's the impact that had. Okay, Amy, you, you said with the fact sheet you could uh, run a highlighter pen through and show all, all contradictions. Talk, talk us through that. So it's very similar to what Ben just explained. I would sit with him and we would go through his timeline stuff. I then, despite knowing and having a, a rough understanding that obviously the prosecution is the one that's responsible for proving the matter, I knew I could get information that supported what we could say or what yeah. he would be saying in court. For example, you know, when he signed with the Balmain Tigers at the end of 1998. Now, I thought, well, where would I find that information? I went, it was kind of weird some of the stuff I did, but I went on to eBay. I used to go and buy big league magazines. Oh, I used right. to find his name in programs yep. and print. I rang a man called... Terry, I'm sure it's Terry, and he runs the New South Wales Rugby League Museum. Right. He provided me with Ben's entire playing history. Got that. No, just give all this stuff yep. to Danny. He would make me PDF it and send it over. I'm very good at making PDFs. I've been ever since. Um, I called Medicare because Ben broke his leg in January, January of 2000, the year 2000. It was significant... And again, when you read the fact sheet, it's a very significant date. And he, he was playing football in Gosford at the, the very first ever game played at North Power Stadium. Yeah. Broke his leg and was taken by ambulance to Gosford. So I knew there would be records of that. Uh, I, I didn't think what I was doing was that uh, unusual. I would have thought investigators would have done that, but they didn't. Um, so I tracked, I tracked, I phoned Medicare. I used to have him there so that they would ID him on the phone because, you know, I can't just get his information. And then he would say he was approving for me to get that. And I had this wonderful woman who gave me every Medicare card he ever had. And then I got every Medicare number he'd ever had. And then I rang Gosford Hospital and they ran everyone through. And she went, oh, here's his, here's his record. She goes, where do you want me to send it? And she sent me his record of him being um, admitted to Gosford Hospital with yep. the break, the injury, the everything, uh, the discharge, his address at the time. I contacted the ATO through my accountants and I said, we need Ben's tax records. We need it to show his address. And and these little pieces of information would, would, would come in and I would be, I don't know, I would be so elated that I could provide more physical evidence that showed he was nowhere near where they were. So the locations and the dates that were in the in the charge sheets, you yes. could discount that because of the records that you gathered through football records, Medicare records, the injury, knowing ATO, where. Yep, all of it. Uh, HCF records, I contacted um, his private health fund, so he spent a year and a half uh, in Nambucca Heads, rehabbing his broken leg. I remember ringing the physio that he said he thought it was called. It's not a huge yep. place. It's not tiny in Nambucca, but it's not huge. 
I spoke to a guy who had actually treated him. He was, oh, we remember him. It was very exciting having a, you know, a up and coming football player here with this injury. And, and you were up there when the, some of these allegations were majority yeah. of the allegations. You're up there getting treatment yes. on your leg and or living in in Balmain. And and the way the allegations are pegged against him, it's saying he's living in a different location and yeah. it's saying that they all happened within this that one this area. And and I think the awful thing is that the police are privy to all of this information. I, I just don't know what they were reading or what they were doing half the time. So, you know, I I I found that so incredibly challenging. Um that it was all there in their brief and the the supporting statements f- for her and what when when you say it was all there in their brief were the pl- did the police have this information that you had did you provide that to them or was oh, that, not until the trial that was for the trial so some of it well they had uh, most of it they certainly had Ben's timeline down yeah. pat from the more senior members of the family the the statements that they more so ran with were um, clearly of people who gave their evidence after reading her statement. So they would give evidence of things that were in her statement that couldn't possibly have happened. So they gave that evidence. There was a number of people that 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 did that for her, friends and, and sisters, definitely. Gave, gave evidence yeah. at the trial. And, and it was obvious. I mean, look, I'm not an investigator. Gosh, I don't even work anywhere close to that field in what I do. But it, to me, this wasn't hard. Well, the, what you just outlined, <laughs> I could have used you on a few investigations oh, I ran. Danny's but, offered me a job before. Yeah, well, it, it is attention to detail. And uh, I talk in the general sense, not not this particular investigation, but when an allegation is made, mm. you've got to investigate it to find out where the truth lies. And there's a responsibility. There's an onus on the police, especially when they're serious allegations of this nature. Find out, uh, yeah, if you're the accused, where were you? The more so to that, you know, there's things through the accuser's statement. Um, there's only one eyewitness, according to the according accuser. to the accuser, yeah, in relation to an allegation or an incident, and we never ever saw a statement from that person. Do you know why there was no statement? Yes. Well, yes. It, yeah, we do. Yeah, there was a police officer went out and saw this particular person. Mm. This person's name was on the the contents. brief contents. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know, I'll ask you a question as a former yeah. investigator. If you've got a an accuser's statement and that accuser has identified a an eyewitness yeah. to an allegation or an incident or whatever you want to call it, would that person be relatively important to talk to before you act? I, I'd say uh, crucial. Oh, yeah. So um, that being the case, that would be someone that you'd probably say you'd want to talk to pretty soon? Yeah. All right. An eyewitness on a historical uh, sexual assault allegation would uh, be crucial. Right. And I, I, I feel comfortable sitting sitting here and saying that now. Yeah, I don't know the full details of the brief, but in a general sense, if uh, someone's made an allegation and uh, said this person can confirm what I've said, that person would be spoken to. Yeah. So despite that, and my arrest was on the 20th of, of December 2016, this person wasn't spoken to, and I'll let you – because I can't remember exactly. It was in Ju- it was July. It was July of 2017, seven months. After my arrest. After Ben was arrested. They finally managed to catch up with this alleged witness. <clears throat> yeah. And the alleged witness was basically fed the paragraph where he came up in a statement, in yep. the accuser's statement, and said, can you verify that? And he said, mate, that is did not happen if I, and and you are talking somebody who is alleged to have been witness mm. to an, inc- an incredibly confronting and serious offense and and it was alleged that he pretty much ripped Ben up and tried to fight him and really confronted him and 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 he disclosed to the detective 
That did not happen. Yeah. If I'd have seen that, he wouldn't be alive. I'd have killed him, basically. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, this, uh, it's certainly in the uh, realms of exculpatory evidence. Absolutely. To support of yours, uh, your position. But I, I would suggest to the credibility of the allegations and uh, or, or lack of credibility. And I, I choose my words carefully and I, I'm comforted by the fact that chat that we had uh, before the uh, podcast when I caught up with you guys that uh, it's not an attack here about the accuser. No. No. It, so it, it, there's- I think that's it's a really important part to understand where we come from yeah. is that we, we have kids. We have friends, we have sisters, we have family. If any one of them came to us and told us, especially our children, that something had happened to them, you would believe your kids. Yeah. And I would never, ever hold judgment against, and and we both, did we speak about this regularly, yeah. but, you know, we would never, ever hold judgment against somebody who believes their own flesh and blood, you, you're not going to Yeah, you're going to su- su- no way. support your family. Yeah, of course you are. And it, would it be fair to say that uh, your frustration is with the investigation, the way the investigation was done? I, I, that Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any question in that. I just, I, I think I yeah. expressed myself pretty clearly before. I just don't understand how some of this stuff wasn't picked up. I really don't. Yeah. I, you know, I just, I, I look at things like that and then you then later find out you get a new and updated brief contents page. And he's gone. And he's gone. <laughs> so, and you just go like. Remove from the brief. The, 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 un, I mean, look, the unfortunate thing, well, it's not the unfortunate thing. I mean, the, the almost again, you go back to kind of going, this is comical. I, I knew that witness and yeah. he rang me two days, one day or two days after that detective had been out to go, Amy, I need you to know that I've been contacted by the police about, I'm aware of what's happening with Ben, but I've been contacted by them. I just want you to know that I've told them the truth and you, you need to feel, I just want you to know that. I went, mate, tell me about it. So, okay. So going about to the trial. What was the, the, the trial like? Talk us your experiences there. Um, Exhausting? No, oh, that's one word for it. No, it's horrible. Like you, you like leading into it, your whole life stops. My, my career stopped. Um, you know, in in a in a broader sense, my freedom stopped. Yep. Um. You know, it's amazing. I don't have a travel bug, but the minute they took my passport, all I wanted to do was go overseas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway. And it was an expired passport know, as well. I know, it was extraordinary. <laughs> but anyway. it, was, it was a principle. Yeah, but um, yeah, you'd have people talk to you about doing stuff and I just, it'd be like, oh, it's, you know, in December, I just, I can't, I can't see you can't, past You can't point. plan. No, so that, that was difficult in itself. Um, going into court for the first time, um, I'll say on that side of the fence, uh, getting shown to, I've got to go and stand in the dock. And the first, uh, when they're, you know, picking the jury, mm. having to stand up in front of, what, 60 odd people I didn't know. Um, and they read those. They put those allegations to you in front of people. I don't care who you are. You're looking at what was I at the time? Maybe thirty eight. Yeah, thirty eight year old man. Um, They're horrendous allegations. And those allegations, you just go, "That is like, who is this bloke?" Ben, I, I I can't even imagine how you you felt in that situation. Like people would be looking at you, people that you love, people that, that you know. You've got their support, but everyone else would be looking there, going, "Has that dirty mongrel done this?" That that would be the. Yeah. Uh, is that how you felt? Did you feel it, like it's? I I don't even, I don't know how I had to do it four times. Yeah, because we we did it the first time, and then after a couple of days, day or two, um, jury discharge. discharge, jury discharge, and then they did it again, 
And then um, we'll obviously get to it in a sec. We had a hung jury. Yep. And then I had to go through it again. And then it was the same thing. They picked a jury and then- Jury hung. Jury- Jury yeah, not hung. Now, jury was, uh, yeah, let go again and then- we got we got the last one, and each each time is costing you money. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's. Uh, you you mentioned the figure, and I was going. We'd talk about the impact, but uh, a rough ballpark figure of how much it costs you just in legal fees and everything else was half a million dollars. Yeah, there are. It's uh, there about. No, not no, yes, definitely, but also other impacting factors. I mean, as we were coming to the end of the first trial, and the jury was out for so long, it was it was never going to be guilty. Yeah. We knew that, but. There was we were being prepared for the real possibility that it would be hung, and the second trial, no, the first trial, first, yeah, and and so that we didn't have to make hasty decisions, we went, let's, we'll sell the house now, and we'll move from one suburb to another suburb, which ended up being one of the, again, if you talk about silver linings, it has ended up being one of the best things we've ever done because we love our house now, and it's provided our kids with just. A network of friends, you know, shaped their lives. But it, 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 yes, there were decisions like that that had to be made. And of course, then we had to sell a house in a falling market. And that was hard. Yeah. And yeah. we had to make those decisions because knowing that we were going to have to do the trial a second time, he'd already been stood down. Yeah. We were now a single wage family. We, it was, Scary. There was real anxiety around that stuff. I found that sometimes when there's a uh, hung jury that uh, the DPP can make a decision not to um, have the matter reheard. Oh, they did it on the same day. They, they gave us a new trial date on the, that day. Right. Were you I, – I found it interesting. You were happy that you had the second trial because – and I think uh, – I can't remember which one of you oh, sent it, it to me. It, it's both of us. You had to clear your name. Yeah. It's as difficult and as painful as it is, mm. you know, having the decision rather than, a you know, a hung, hung jury and the DPP decide not to run with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's like it's never. That would leave that stain that. Uh, you know, not, not that it doesn't anyway, but, you know, we, we put our case forward. Um, we showed, you know, we put my, put my story. Yeah. You know, as you know, there's a lot of people who don't get up in that box and, and so they just, they're happy not to, not did, to talk. Did, do you get up and give evidence? Yeah, I, I got up and gave evidence on both occasions. I'll just explain that to our listeners that uh, accused people aren't required to give evidence on their behalf and the often the advice is don't put the accused in the witness box because they're opening themselves up to cross-examination. But the fact that you got in the witness box, I like the fact that people, yeah, you, you're getting in the witness box because you've got a story to um, to tell. You needed to tell the truth. Yeah, the, well, the truth, well, not a story. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah that was probably a lot <laughs> wrong. Uh, no, Don't worry, we pick people on words yeah, like that. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> yeah. do these days. Um, but, yeah, it's um, – yeah, it was it, – it was, it's important. It was important for me to do that. So, at the trial, you, um, you're you watching the trial proceed. Did you think you were going to be found – did you ever have any doubts that you'd be found guilty with we'll what have was being presented? Really different responses to that. I never, ever in my life – felt that he wasn't coming home. Yep. I I would ask Danny questions that he would refuse to answer, <laughs> um, such as, is this going to be okay? He would never answer that, but then I would manipulate the question so he'd have to answer it in a way that <laughs> – so things I like – I might have to get Danny on this podcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you should. Uh, good fella. But, um, you know, I would say – do people get convicted of things that they haven't done? And he would say yes. And I, I, would, I, I would too, I, just I, quietly. I'm aware. Um, but then I would say, have you ever had somebody who did not commit the crimes that they were, you know, charged with, convicted? Yeah. And he'd say no. <laughs> so I could yeah. manipulate that. But whereas for Ben, I think yeah. it was I'm, extremely I'm different. Very, I'm different. Uh, not that... <laughs> There was just so much unknown. Yeah. So much unknown. And 
I had the most incredible team with me in Danny and Brett Longville and obviously all my family and that that were there. But the most, the challenging part of the trial was the minute Brett stopped talking. Right. The minute the jury goes out, it doesn't matter what's happened. Nothing else can be said. It's all done. It's all been put on the table. And you now leave it to 12 people to make a decision as to what, you know, mm. what they believe. You know, um, I don't know whether it's, are they looking at it from a legal point of view? Are they just going, oh, I think, I know, are they looking at it right? You just, that's the unknown that is really difficult. And I'm not, you know, I'm not chipping jury members like, it, no, like but it, it's the system works most of the time, but it's not a perfect system. With yeah, the jury. And, I'd, and I'd gone through it, so I up. Um, I went through it the first time. I think the jury was out for like 10, like 10 days. days. Yeah. You know, and it was just, and every day having to get up, get dressed, kiss your kid, kids goodbye for what you think may or could be the last time for. A long time, if you know, if it doesn't turn out the way that I know that it should, um, was horrific. It was emotional torture beyond recognition, and um, you know there was there were some difficult times during that period. Um, you know, every day doing it, getting there. Three forty-five seemed to be the best time of the day because generally, if you didn't have an answer by then, I was going to go home and see my kids. Um, yeah, and, you know, we got there at the end. And I, I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, the way you've described it there. So, I, I can just picture you, you're there, you say goodbye to your kids and if the jury comes back today, because they can come back at any time, so 10 days, they could have come back on day one, you just don't know. And if you're found guilty, you would have been taken straight into custody and- uh, did you how did how did you cope in those situations? I I don't know. We I mean we just we had such a good network of people with us. It was the worst time, but also I guess especially in that second trial, to to know the jury was back with a verdict. I mean I that feels like yesterday that those words came out. And we stood, uh, I wear an Apple Watch most of the time. My heart rate, I uh, would love to have known what yours was. Mine was, a, I think it was pretty close to having a heart attack. <laughs> Mine was at 187, just sat in. The, <laughs> this is from your Apple Watch. From the, my Apple Watch, yeah, taking my heart waiting rate. For it. And just waiting for that verdict. But um, at that point, I don't know. It, it, it's the worst time, but also... I look at photos, my phone is like a, a journal, but I look at photos of us before and after and we actually look like different people. But I actually look at photos of us before any of, I mean, I know we've aged a bit in the last six years, but I look at photos of us before this happened and then say two months after Ben's arrest and we look like we aged, I don't know, 10 years it feels like overnight, like it was just, it just took its toll, didn't it? Yeah, it was. Well, there's no words to explain how difficult that was. No. You know, but. And did you you have um, media when this was Never. Going? No. going? I, I, I was kind of surprised. Yeah. yeah. You know, I really, that was probably one of the biggest concerns that I had, you know, for me and the family more so. Um but yeah. surprising. Yeah, it was surprising. It's and a suppression order on it though. Yeah, but I think that the, you know, and the other thing that was continually relayed to me yeah. was the, um, you know, the reputational damage that could happen to the, to where I worked. Yeah. So, there was obviously a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of things sort of going, you know, it was like a no, it was just it was it was horrible. Yeah, there was, was a horrible. lot of media at court, though. But I'm not sure whose fault that <laughs> Don't was. Don't you laugh at me? <laughs> <laughs> this just to clarify, I clarify what these two are just accusing me of this time. <laughs> but uh, 
and I only found this out when we uh, we met up that uh, when I asked the question about media that the media was in fact following my <laughs> child my exploits that time and you two was escaping out the back door and uh, I had to front the media each day but uh, look I, I I laugh about it it's not a, not a laughing no, matter not. it's um yeah I'm glad I could help in in that regards but and I, I said this, and I, I think I've said it before. When I was walking to court, uh, to central local court, because we both you had your trial going, I had had mine going, and I, I said to my son as I was walking from Central Railway Station, "Imagine if you were," and I felt the pressure, and well, I was going to get a slap over the wrist and a fine or, or whatever. I felt the pressure walking to court, and I said to my son, "Can you imagine if you uh, were facing a, uh, a serious charge where your life could just be?" taken away depending on the court decision. We say that all the time now. If it, Not that we'd like to hang around or go near the Downing Centre. Spent way too much time there. But if you ever see, I don't know, anyone, they look, you can tell when people are dressed to go to court, they just don't look quite right. And <laughs> as in like they look uncomfortable in their yeah. nice clothes. I don't mean in their personality. But um, you just think, God, I hope, I hope they're okay. <laughs> It's- yeah, that's that's the big thing. It's uh, you know, and it's the one thing that you know I'm probably proud of since all this is that you know I've had you know friends, kids, and stuff that have got themselves into either a bit of strife, yeah. and I just feel like I'm now in a position to be able to help. And you know, we've done it a few times now where we've been able to offer assistance. That's changed, changed their lives. Yeah, you know, and 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 if that's if that's something that I can do from here on with anybody, then that's that's what I'll do. That's exactly what you do, Gary. Now. Yeah, but it, well, it does change your your perspective on things, doesn't it? I think you can look very much. Oh, the world's set up this way, and looking at life through the lens of a, a police officer and then seeing it on the other other side it's it's changed my my view on things and with this particular podcast it was one of the more difficult ones preparing for because it's such a, a sensitive subject isn't it in this in this day and age and like uh, allegations of sex, sexual assault and i think it's important for people to understand yeah these are the consequences this is what crime is about when you you're talking people being charged and the impact it has on not just one person, but on so many, so many different different lives. We talked about the accuser, and and yeah, I th- I think you quite uh, generously have said you're not holding ill will to that uh, that person. But do you think it reaffirms you're an ex cop? I'm an ex cop. To me, it just reaffirms the importance of the work that you do as a policeman that you got to do it properly. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, that. You break it down. You break what you do down into minutes and seconds. A decision you make to to grab someone yep. and go, you're under arrest, can change that person's life forever. Yeah, forever. And <laughs> you know, and 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 f- for not because of who I was or the position that I was that I held at that particular point in time. It just it's it's anybody like and you know. Everybody should have the ability, you know, to make a complaint. Yeah. You know, if, if you know, I'm not chipping people who are saying that they're, you know, if they're, if they're a victim of an offence, you should be able to go and speak to someone who is a professional in that, that field and get, you know, get a proper and thorough, fair investigation done. You know, but- that should always it should equally, you know, be for the for the person who's being accused as well. Yeah, it should be equally as fair, you know, and proper and professional. And when when there's not that, you know, when when that doesn't happen, and it's either favoured one way or another, or things are left out. You know, you talk about exculpatory and yeah, you know, evidence and so forth. Then. Accountability then is a big, big thing. I, I think there needs to be more accountability in uh, in policing and the responsibility. I think you know what we've talked about here highlights the, the power that you carry. 
the responsibility of investigating serious allegations should not be taken lightly. And it's not a job that you can do flippantly. And uh, I, I'm talking general here. It's a job that needs to, you dedicate your time to it, you look at it properly before you uh, take someone's liberty away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, and we're just talking about my case in particular. Yep. You know, personally, I believe there are so many other things that should have happened in this matter before I was even put in that situation. It seems a bit premature that they've gone to the, the path that they went to arrest you, bail, refuse you, and uh, stuff that hadn't been properly uh, properly investigated. Yeah, well, not, not you know, take, uh, you know, premature, yes, but I, I, I look more so on the fact that why did it take him so long to speak with the alleged only eyewitness, not given by me, hmm. this is by the accuser. Yeah. And if it's if it's direct evidence, that's yeah, that's crucial. But even if it goes to the credibility of the acu accuser, it's uh, important. Mm. He he was very direct evidence because he was our first witness. Okay, which was quite <laughs> quite powerful after the detective took the stand and said he didn't recall anything, which was also very interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk on that in, mm. in a sec. How did you, first of all, how did you guys feel? Talk us through the moment when it's come back not guilty. The Well, there was a few to get through, so it took a little <laughs> okay. bit of time. Sorry, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, but, I shouldn't be laughing, but no, yeah, you're quite right. It would have been 12 yeah, offences and No, 12. it was- 11 offences, 12 people, 136, 132 decisions of not guilty. Is that yeah, right? It I was, right. Um, yeah, it was funny because there was a, not funny, I, I yeah. you know, used the term in probably an uncomfortable state, but-, but I was sitting in the dock and looking at the jury and the the you know the the jury member that came out as the floor, floor person. Yep. And um, I didn't really expect that particular person to be the person. She's the youngest yeah, she, on the she, jury she the by young, far. Yeah. She's been early twenties, mid twenties at best. And the first thing that I realised is that she didn't she didn't have any paperwork with her. Yep. So. I was sitting there and I mean, it's a lot of – first thing that's going through Maddie is that's a lot of a lot of things to remember if you haven't got a piece of paper. Yeah. And it went offence one, not guilty. And it was at that point I went, if there's – you'd hate to stuff that up as a, as a f floor person. Yeah. And I, I, you know, and I literally just closed my eyes and just – let them roll and they start, they just kept rolling. It was not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And I could hear, um, you know, the people that I had in the gallery, yep. they're quite upset um, and emotional. And yeah, it just, it was, and then it was, it just finished. It was just silence. And then they were excused. And but I'm still sitting in the dock and I'm, I'm sort of there going, man, I just want to get out of here. And, yeah, and then I was uh, I was excused by, by the judge and, um, yeah, and then it was – for there it was just – I sat out in that – the foyer area just out the front of the little courtroom there and we just sat there for like – would have been half an hour. Calling people. Calling people and, you know, it was just a really – emotional it's like it was just years of emotion just uh, was there, there tears I oh, would imagine. oh yeah yeah it was it was yeah it, it was like i'd yeah I, I can't i can't put it into words properly yeah. to explain how emotionally fueled that was because there was people there that had sort of just blown in and blown out yeah there were people that weren't there that had been there the entire time and they were required to do other duties for us on the day. Like pick kids up from school, my mum. You know, and it was just, yeah, and we ended up going going out and we went down just the road, it was like 100 metres and we, uh, you know, 
the girls that were there had a had a couple of drinks. I had, what did I have? Like a banana smoothie or something. <laughs> I don't drink. <laughs> Never and has. I, and I just, and I just. Did like, you drink for him? You know, Always have. And I just, I, I was sitting there and that's when I asked Danny that question yeah. about, you know, how long. What could that if, And, uh, you know, and then we walked from there and we walked all the way down to Wynyard. And caught the beeline. Caught, caught the beeline. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just, and you just you get home and you take the, and the suits, I don't think I've worn again. They're yeah. hanging in my, you know. Just bad memories for you. Oh, you know, and I always get the, you know, you should get rid of them. I just went, well, you know. <laughs> should get them framed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, no. but no, it was, um, yeah, it was it was emotionally fueled. It was it was a. I, I, I can see on your face that yeah. the, the, the relief. And Amy, you, you all look like you're going to get emotional just thinking about it. it so. I took a photo of us. I don't know why. I used to take a photo of our hands. We would often hold, we actually don't really hold hands at all, but I would often put a picture of our hands on my Instagram story yep. every day because I knew people wanted to know or at least feel connected to us every day that we went on the bus to court, every day. And one, that particular morning that we ended up with a verdict, not that we knew that we would, I took a photo of the two of us together just, and I think I put it on my Instagram and said, we're still here, we're okay, we're hanging in there. And... It's just like it was like gravity had taken control of how we looked. It was just so drawn and awful. But then I took the same photo on the way home. And granted, I'd had a couple of martinis, which probably <laughs> made me feel really great. But we look like different people. We're in yeah. the same clothes and we look like different people. And the photos are, what, 12 hours apart? It was... I look. I should actually take them out of my phone because it's a. It's a real. Uh, it takes me straight back whenever I see them, but it was a really significant. It's. It was, I don't know. It. Fe- it's so long ago. It feels so long ago. Like twenty nineteen. I don't know. To us, feels yeah. long ago. I don't know how it feels for you. Uh, going through what you did at a similar time, but but it also feels like yesterday. Yeah. All at the same time. Yeah, I, it's something that stays with you, isn't it? That, yeah. Uh, you, you're reliving it. But, uh, yeah, I, the consequences of what you guys were, were going through is incredible. And I, I think the fact that you guys have stayed together under that type of pressure. Mm. But I, I won't let you get away with it. I want to talk about the the <laughs> argument. Because I ask, <laughs> ask you guys, have you, yeah, how did you stay together? Did you fight or this or that? And you, you both said, oh, we had one argument and you were ashamed of it. Tell us about the argument. I'll, I'll start it. So, it was your fault. I uh, know so, oh, it was. Yeah, I'll take take one for the men there. Yeah. The, uh, it's always, always the man's fault. No, I, I put, as you do, Take you in, get your suits dry cleaned. I put have been a Friday afternoon, maybe, or even a Saturday morning. Get He's them done. Just sweat through the whole suit, like. And, and I've put them in, and we're supposed to pick them up on Sunday. You, you were supposed and, to. And oh god, this is going to yeah, happen again. No, <laughs> and and we're there, and it's just like we had dinner ready to go on a Sunday night, and the penny dropped. Oh my god, my suits! They're at the dry cleaners, and my I've. We're into each other about who, whose responsibility it was. Who hadn't reminded who? I'm then in a car flying up there to try to, and you know, they've got the electric thing. That I didn't have, a thing, I didn't know what was yeah. going on, so never done that before. <laughs> so yeah, I end up getting back, and we could, I couldn't get my suit out. So yeah, it was it was the only time throughout the entire thing that we ended up having a good <laughs> a good argument over. I walked out of the house to kind of cool my jets and just try to think (laughs) and clear my head and went for a walk with the dog. But I walked down this very dark path and tripped over absolutely A over T and took skin off everything, my hands, my knees. I think even my face had hit the ground. I was sitting in a heap with, with my dog crying, going, oh, my, this is honestly our lives. Like, is this really the life that we are currently stuck living? I can't remember how you got the suit. You got it. No, I end up it end up getting it out somehow. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it all, all worked out. But that was, yeah, throughout the – despite the amount of pressure that we were put under, yeah. Yeah, that, that, if that's the worst that we had to deal with in terms of us to 
it's it's not that bad. No, well, I, full credit to you. I, honestly, the the way that you've described it, and I get the sense of sense of the pressure. Um, now, post uh, post trial, and you get uh, acquitted. But yeah, as we know, sometimes an acquittal doesn't. People go, "Oh, it just wasn't enough evidence," and all that. The fact that you guys are coming out and still talking about this, I, I get the sense that you just want to put the, set the record straight in so many different ways. And you gave me access to a, uh, a, a document that uh, a formal written complaint to um, a uh, police command about the fact that uh, the accuser had uh, admitted in uh, in during the uh, court matter that uh, she was being untruthful. Yes, that went that went through. What what's happened happened with that complaint? Because it was a, a written complaint and uh, from uh, signed off by uh, Danny E, your lawyer, and uh, a complaint. What's ha- what's happened with that complaint? Nothing. Nothing. Right. Yeah. So nothing. Nothing with that one. It. Um, yeah. It's look. It's not. It, it's not even that much of a sore spot for us. We put a complaint in after the first trial. Nothing. Nothing. And and that's – I don't feel like we're that hung up on that. I mean, we, it, it it's referenced to a fair bit um, because I, I guess for us there's always that sort of feeling of, you know, we always need to kind of tell that just to kind of reinforce how bad this whole thing was and how unbelievably – you know, whenever we talk about it, we come back to the timeline, the the issues, the, the humongous issues around the timeline. You put in a uh, another complaint uh, about the police. There, it's uh, unsubstantiated. The complaint. It's still just floating floating around there. What was the so the we details put a, there? We put a complaint through Leck, um, one of the police officers. Leck being the law enforcement. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, Set up to investigate police. Yes. Yep. Um, we put a complaint through Leck to um, obviously, you know, investigate, do what they do in relation to this. Yep. Um, it was our belief that uh, was it's just it's in it's in court documents. Yeah. Um, that an investigator came in, gave a set of circum uh, set of evidence in the first trial. Very different in the in the second trial, and then was asked to come back the following day and said the evidence that he gave the day before um, was incorrect. Was incorrect, right? Um, so a complaint went in about that through Leck. Um, Leck have then sent it back to professional standards, from my understanding, with recommendations not for a particular local area command to investigate it, right? Um, Despite that, it went back to that command and uh, there was a fair bit of bouncing around to find a- um, Investigator who could do it. There was no conflict of interest. Right. Um, And then it just felt like it was just stopped. Emails went to the investigator trying to get updates every three months. Yep. my understanding is we we just got the occasional email. We're just waiting for transcripts. Okay. Um, and from there, it was about eighteen months down the track. Uh, that's when we got the email indicating that under some section of the Police Service Act, they don't have to investigate. They don't, they're not going to investigate it. So um, it went back to Lek. Yeah, we then sent. Uh, it went back to Lek, and. Um, asking for them to review it and we then got advice back from LEC that um, they've spoken to Northern Beaches and they're happy with the investigation. Now, my argument with that is that- Mm. What investigation? They've said they're not conducting an investigation. So, I don't know what, where all that went, but that was the the end of it. So, that- um, That's been frustrating. That's been the frustrating part for us is that they're just and when we talk about it earlier in terms mm. of accountability um there just isn't any no it's uh i i've long held views not just 
what's happened to me, it probably reinforced it. But uh, I've long held the view that police shouldn't be investigating uh, police. It's it's too entwined. There's too many uh, agendas, and uh, I think what you've what you've described there. And in fairness, we've got to say that yeah, you've made the allegations. It's been investigated. They're saying, well, it, it doesn't have to be investigated, and the yeah, contrary uh, responses you've got back. So you spent roughly, I think, ballpark figure five hundred thousand dollars to defend these allegations against you. Um, when you were found not guilty, do you get uh, costs back? Do you get that money back? No. So that's lost five hundred thousand dollars. Yep. To defend yourself, it's a high stakes game, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I'm not. For a minute, complaining about the people who were defending us yeah. because they are just the most incredible people ever. I can't speak any highly, uh, high, highly of uh, of both Danny and Brett. They were just incredible, uh, and the amount of time and effort and work that went into it um, was beyond my comprehension. Um, you know, and to be fair, you know. Their work was probably made, and they'd probably agree with this, made much easier having Amy <laughs> doing what she was doing in the background. How much did Aunt Amy charge you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> You're still, still paying. Life, yeah. <laughs> You're still, still, pay, pay, no, still paying that off. Yeah, but no, it was, you know, the expense, you know, it's mortifying. Yeah. It's how, much, how much it costs and the amount of time and, you know, it's probably a real good life lesson for for police to have an understanding as to the the damage that it can cost this is the impact you know if you're going to rush into something yeah make a bad decision there's, there's a big responsibility when you uh, charge people yeah those complaints have gone in and they're at this point as far as we can see un unsubstantiated are you going to take this matter any further what's happened to you that that option's available to us okay we you know we're as we're, we're sitting here today, we're not going away. Right. Um, you know, I, I, we have three boys. Yep. Um, you know, and it's, you know, it's our obligation to make sure that, you know, they can look up to us yeah. in our life and go, you know, you're not going to get trotting on and spat out the other side of it and do nothing about it. So, you know, we're, you know, I hope that, you know, they can look at us in however many years and go, you know, you guys put up the fight that you, you yeah. know, they're, 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 they're the people that we want to look up so, to. So, potentially civil action? Yeah, I yeah. would say that's, that's probably on the cards, but um, we will just be guided um, by Danny. Yeah. Uh, and we'll just keep... Keep doing what we do. There is a level of fight in us now, I think, yeah. that <laughs> we've probably developed over the last or going through what we went through. So, yeah, we won't stop. <laughs> ben, the investigation into uh, into this, uh, the allegations against you, was that being conducted from a command that you worked in? So the simple answer to that is yes. Um, we... Yeah, back years ago, uh, there was lots of little stations all over the place. Um, you know, due to management and so forth, they created these super stations that all the little stations would form part of a super station. So my command or where I worked fell, yeah. fell within the realms of within that within command. this. Command. So it's people you've worked with and, yes. and people that you've been involved in in yes. the ten years that you're in the police. After you were found not guilty, you'd been suspended without pay from the Crime Commission. Yep. The Australian Crime Commission. Did you get your job back? Yes. So, Monday morning, uh, so I was found not guilty or fully, you know. Yep. On the Monday, straight back on the books, um, I got back paid. Yep. And uh, there was just... I was I, I didn't work. I was on the books, not getting paid for a for a long time. Right. Like we're talking probably six months before I even had any other contact from the agency. 
Um, and then it was, yeah, I had to go make sure that I was mentally in, in the right frame of mind. Okay, so after the not guilty, they put you back on the books. On the books, But yep. you weren't working, you Correct. were getting paid, but. Yep. Yep. Then uh, COVID happened. Yeah, so I had a couple of, um, so I had to go just make sure everything mentally was, was all good at that time. Then COVID hit and, um, yeah, and then it was, I got an email, got to come back into the office. So in the office I go um, and there was an arrangement made between me and one of the bosses that it would take a very short period of time to get me from there, from A to B. To get and from A to B, you're talking about becoming operational again. Correct. Yep. You've got to do um, a, a test shooting. Yeah, uh, get you, all that sort of stuff. Driving, get and qualified again. Yeah, so I was I was given four to six weeks yep. to get myself back up and operational. Yeah. And when I went in for this meeting on this first day, I I got told that it was unachievable and I was looking at more like two years before I was going to be operational. And there was a whole bunch of things where – they were talking about retraining me and all sorts of weird, wonderful things. And yeah, you know, then I was given an alternate role and a desk about five meters away from where I had to walk into that office that very day. And good um, memories. Yeah, and I was I was told that uh, there was a whole bunch of cops in the room next door waiting to lock me up. That was where I was asked to sit. There, and. Yeah, they, they weren't equipped for me at that particular point in time. And uh, despite that, um, yeah, because of the way in which the initial arrest happened and how it happened and obviously getting the phone call and being told that, Dara, mate, don't lose any sleep tonight over it. Um, Degree of trust would have- Well, trust, but also with Ames, every time I walk, step foot into that building, it was, uh, you know, if she couldn't get a hold of me for whatever reason, you could only imagine the anxiety that it would have gone through for her. So, yeah. between um, all of that, it was just, it wasn't worth the pain and anguish we'd gone through too much at that particular You made a time. conscious decision and, and yeah. resigned. Yeah. And it was, you, you know- You were made redundant. Yeah. I, was, uh, I got a voluntary redundancy through, yep. the, through the agency and, um, you know, we- yeah, you know, we're, we're we're mate, we're happy. We are kicking. Yeah, you know, we 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 live. Yeah. What's your last thoughts on uh, the what was done to you? Uh, from the police. From from police. At, oh, sorry. So, well, in relation to the accuser. Yep. Um. <sighs> What do you, I, I can't I, I can't say any like it's just a case of you know at some point in my life I've crossed paths with someone that you know has you know for whatever reason had things in their life where they've had to do something like that yep I can't I can't speak for them um, I don't know why people do things like this. Um, from from that part, that's probably as as good as I can yeah. give. Uh, in relation to the police, uh, just be honest. Yeah, I don't understand how any other normal investigator would come to that conclusion if they did the job. Yeah, ethically, professionally, and looked at. The whole thing, both sides, look at the whole thing and then and then come up with your, you know, your fact sheet. But a cut and paste of a of a statement. Yeah, an accuser it, statement that's it, not it, 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 it does, for me, it don't, it, it don't work. Pe people that are being investigated or, uh, you know, have, have are working with police because of something that may have happened to them – should not need to feel concerned that police will pick and choose the information that they will put into a brief of evidence. That's where it leaves. That's where it is for me. And that's okay. what my kids are taught that now. They they 
are taught you, you don't have to speak to police. If they ask you a question, you don't have to answer it. <laughs> you shouldn't talk to them if they bring you into, uh, you know, you have a right to silence and you should live your life by it. And that yeah. makes me a bit sad sometimes. Because it's not the Amy pre this incident. No, it's not. It's not. I, I, I'm a incredibly different person. If I have Facebook memories that come up now, this is going to sound awful. I don't, that doesn't matter. But if I have Facebook memories come up now that have something in support of or I might have a, you know, the little blue and white checkers because yeah. of something that has happened, because that comes up each year in a memory and they cut, Facebook shows you different memories, I have to delete it because I have such a hate. I have such a dislike, I would say hatred, for that uniform yeah, and for what they have chosen to do to him and to us and why. I remember saying to Ben once, why does this detective have it in for you? What, what, why? And he would go, I don't know him. I haven't, you know, the, the one that left out the, <laughs> the eyewitness. But I, I don't get it. I don't get why we can't put that complaint in and have somebody go, this is not okay. Yeah. That's the biggest thing for me. I, I have concerns with police investigating police. I just that that's that's my concerns, and people can say, "Oh, because of what's happened to you." I've always held those held those concerns. Police should be set up best to investigate police, but it's not about. I, I don't think people can be impartial. Yeah, the bloke that uh, and not singling him out, but the bloke that came to arrest you that you knew, like it's hard to be impartial where you know a person, and uh, well, yeah. I think they uh, maybe in that case they need to feel in particular with people who are in law enforcement, they, they need to be a little bit more, not heavy handed, but they need to go over the top to show that they're being, you know, they're being more than what they need to for the accuser. You know, yeah. or for the system to go, listen, I- Okay, that's a, a valid point. I see what you're saying. That's almost like the pendulum swinging at- completely across just to show that, look, we're, we're, we're going after this person hard just because he's a cop. Uh, it, it could very well be that case. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Like, I, as I said, preparing for this, I was nervous about it because it's such a difficult subject to, to talk about, but I really appreciate you, your uh, openness and the willingness to talk about it. I hope you're all the best for the future. And... Uh, I still, uh, yeah, full credit to you going through what you've gone and uh, keeping it together. And and I'd like to say not come out, not come out bitter. You've changed, but you still can see some, uh, yeah, happiness in the world, and it's not all uh, doom and gloom. So full credit to you guys. No, I appreciate it. Okay, cheers. Thank you.